I want to read from Luke 17, from verse 5 to verse 10. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamore tree, mulberry tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be planted into the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he's come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. So likewise ye, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Praise God for the reading of his word. Faith that worketh by love is a powerful force. It's one of the most powerful forces that God has given us to live by. Faith is a spiritual force. In fact, faith is a law. It works all the time. And if you will work it, like any law, and it has predictable results. And so the apostles here said, Lord, increase our faith. Now, as I looked at this, I wondered... Why would they say to Jesus, increase our faith? I can only draw the conclusion that they saw how he lived. They saw the works that he did. They saw how he pleased his father. And they wanted to operate at that level. There were some things that seemingly they were not able to do. Even one case where they couldn't deliver a boy from demon. And, but Jesus delivered him. And they wanted to know why couldn't we deliver him. And so faith is a powerful spiritual force. And we do need faith to increase. They wanted more faith. You see, family, faith is the economy of the kingdom. We have money as an economy of our world. Money is a medium of exchange for goods and services. You can't purchase something beyond your ability to pay for it. And even if you want to finance it, they're going to check your record if you can pay those installments. And so if you run a business, then you supply people with goods and services. And they give you their goods and services, but you take their money. So in the world that we live in, money is a medium of exchange for goods and services. Settle that. You may get something for nothing, but somebody paid for it. There's really in the bottom line, nothing free in life. In the kingdom of God, while we're in the world, we're not of this world. We are of the kingdom. The medium of exchange for every promise to be manifest in your life is faith. Faith works in the spiritual realm how money works in the natural realm. God gave us faith to be a lifestyle for us. I want to read Romans 1, 16 and verse 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone, everyone, you included there, 
to the Jew first and to the Greek, the Gentiles, all the nations of the world. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just, the righteous, shall live by faith. So faith is a lifestyle, not ashamed of the gospel. You got to deal with this thing about being ashamed of Christianity. Most probably that is what is affecting you because somehow among some circles, you're afraid to say you're saved. You're afraid or you're ashamed to witness for Jesus. For whatever reason, the Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed. Say, I'm not ashamed. Say that online. I'm not ashamed. Yes, you've got to deal with that shame because the devil wants you to be ashamed to destroy your life. The righteous are bold as a lion. We've got to come into a place where we are bold with what we believe. Hallelujah. Other religions are bold with what they believe. Uh, The world system is bold with their systems. They won't compromise their systems for anybody. And sometimes we cringe as Christians and yet Jesus did so much for us. No, you are not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And for all those of you that have been born again, All those of you that have been baptized and will be baptized, you are not ashamed of Jesus. You're not ashamed of the gospel. And you will be a soul winner. And you will please the Lord. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And he tells us why he's not ashamed. It is the power of God unto salvation. That word power is dunamis. It's explosive, miracle, working power. Now, what is that explosive, miracle, working power that Paul says? It's the word of God. It is the gospel of Christ. That's why you have to study the Bible to rightfully divide it when it's speaking and teaching us about who Christ is and who we are. That's what the gospel of Christ is about. Who Christ is and Christ is his church. Christ is the body uh, in the earth. And so every time you get enlightened about Christ, you're getting more power. Can you see that? The gospel of Christ is equivalent to the dynamis working power of God. So how much Power is working in your life is how much word is in your heart. You see, if you're not ashamed of the gospel, then that should be the word level in your life. So your faith is measured by the word level in your heart. The power of God that's working miracles in your life and in other people's lives is also measurable by the word of God in your heart. So if you want more power, it's not about praying for more power. Where is God going to get more power than he's given you? He's given you all power. No, it's us who got to feed off the Bible. We've got to fill our hearts with the word of God. And the power of God, the demonstration of God, of course it's by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit never works outside the word of God. When the Spirit of God was moving in Genesis 1, the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Nothing was happening as far as a revolution is concerned. Nothing was happening as far as transformation was concerned. It only began happening when God said, let there be light. Then there was light. 
You see, when God spoke his word, then the Holy Spirit had ammunition to work. And so you're going to have to learn to fill your heart with the Word of God. Fill your mind with the Word of God, particularly the Word of your house, the doctrine of your home, the apostolic doctrine that you must continue in. We do have an apostolic doctrine in this house. And so that's the doctrine, that's the teaching you've got to continue in. That's the early church continued in the apostles' doctrine. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed what I preach. I live this 24-7. And therefore, I always have a demonstration of the power of God working in my life. Always have that available. I'd never want to live without that demonstration. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. That word salvation is from a word soteria. And it means more than being born again. It means, it covers being born again, but it covers winning souls. You need the power of God to win souls. Whenever I travel, I'm winning souls. Whether at airports, wherever, those that travel with me know I'm witnessing about Jesus. I'm very aggressive about leading people to the Lord. Very, very, very. I don't give them the opportunity. And this is how I will do it. I said, do you know Jesus died for your sins? Very lovingly, do you know Jesus died for your sins? And so they would say most of the time, yes. I I can't even remember anybody who told me they didn't hear that Jesus died for their sins. Then I would say, Do you know that he rose again from the the dead on the third day? Then they would say, yes. So then I would say, have you given your life to Jesus? Then they would say, no, I'm trying. I haven't done it. I'm this religion. I said, can I pray for you? You see, once somebody knows Jesus died for their sins, once somebody knows Jesus rose again from the dead, It's time to thrust in the sickle and reap it. Can I pray for you? There are very, very few people in my life that when I ask them, can I pray for you, have said no. Very few people. There is Pastor Pumalela, and it's my pride and joy to share the testimony because you're always having people that have never heard the testimony. So I witnessed to him Many, many years ago, how long are you married? 25 years. years. So it's many years ago before that. He was a hard nut to crack. He was involved in, steeped in ancestral worship. And so the more I tried to bring him to that place, hey, I couldn't get it right. And then he wanted to get married to Monica. And Monica was a wonderful daughter in in the church. And God gave me a drop of his wisdom. And I, I agreed to do it. But in my heart I'm saying, how can I marry, uh, conduct a ceremony of someone so precious with somebody who is bound by ancestral worship? And in the vows, I put the sinner's prayer in there. <laughs> he knew nothing. I didn't ask him for permission because Jesus didn't ask him for permission to die for him. Jesus died for you without your permission. And so when it got to that place, I made him repeat the sinner's prayer. And that day was his marriage and his born again day at the same time. Look at him today. Imagine if I buckled in and I didn't do that because I was ashamed. You wouldn't have Pastor Pumalela here. And he's such a wonderful man of God. And we love him. And he's adding so much value to the work of God. And so when I ask somebody that question, I know I got the power of God. I know the power of God is residing within me. I also know that he knows Jesus died for their sins. I also know that he knows Jesus rose again from the dead. 
I also know that the Bible says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess him with your mouth, you are saved. We make it so complicated. We make it so hard. We want to explain from Genesis to Revelation to Reaper Soul. Just share your testimony. How many people have just shared my testimony? I once was lost, I'm found. I once was blind. I was once a drug addict. I mean, 46 years ago, I'm saved, 47. I still tell people I was once an addict. I still tell people I was once bound by alcohol. I still tell people I was on my road to hell. I still tell people that I was suicidal. I still tell people the last thing my mother did was to put a New Testament Bible on my headboard. And then I lead them to the Lord. Say this prayer after me, I say to them. I said, I believe Jesus died for my sins. I say to them, I believe Jesus rose again on the third day. I say, now say this. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the operation of faith. The Bible says, you saved. Then they saved. I lay hands upon them and I, I've done my job. If I know where to direct them, I direct them. But I, I've led people to the Lord. Untold thousands of people, my Anne and I have led to the Lord. And so I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Of course, it's for being born again, but it's for winning souls. If you need to be delivered, it's for deliverance. If you need to be healed, it's for healing. If you need to maintain your health, it's for health. If you need preservation, that's the way you get it. If you need the blessings of God to be manifest in your life, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth, you, you, you live out what you believe, and it works for you. It's always worked for me in the name of Jesus. So the Bible says in Romans 1.17, for therein, in this gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. It's revealed that you are right with God now. You're born again, you're a child of God. You, you once were a sinner and now you're a saint. And therein, it's in the gospel, in this power, that you made righteous. And then it says, the just shall live by faith. So what does it mean the just shall live by faith? The just are the righteous ones. The just are the born again ones. The just are those who have Jesus in their heart. Now, they are called to live by faith. They called that faith is a lifestyle. You must make faith a lifestyle. Some people only live by faith if they have a problem. I have found, for me, if I only want to live by faith when things go wrong, it's much harder than living by faith when everything is going right and then when you're attacked, You've been doing something right for so long, you can withstand the devil. Most people only want to live by faith because they want to overcome a problem. The Bible doesn't say that's how you live by faith. The Bible says it's a lifestyle. The just shall live by faith. Now I was thinking about what can I use in the natural that is a lifestyle. Then I thought about breathing. Breathing is synonymous of life. When someone dies, you put a mirror there. If you don't see no cloud, you must know there's no more breathing. They're dead. But as long as they're breathing, they got life. So it's synonymous of life. Your blood transports oxygen to the cells of your body. So you breathe in oxygen into your lungs. And then 
this oxygen goes into your blood, right, Moyan? And then the blood transports the oxygen to every cell in your body. So I got a wife as a nursing sister. So she's helped me to make sure you know some of these things. If you don't breathe for longer than 10 minutes, you most probably will die. Very few people, I think somebody has broken a record of not breathing for about 20 minutes. But you, you can't stay alive and not breathe for 20 minutes. In fact, you've got to do a lot of breathing exercises. And you've got to be very physically fit to be able to hold your breath. Now, breathing is something you will do unconsciously. But you can do it consciously too. But you will never ever be able to commit suicide by not breathing. Just say, I want to commit suicide now. I won't breathe. You made a choice, but your unconscious mind will override that choice. So breathing is a lifestyle. Just right now you're breathing in oxygen. You're breathing out carbon dioxide. It's a lifestyle. I'm trying to show you how faith must be that type of lifestyle in the realm of the spirit. You live by faith. And maybe that's just where the problem is. We don't make that a lifestyle. We make the lawyer's report a lifestyle. We make the doctor's report a lifestyle. We make the bank statement report a lifestyle. I'm not suggesting that there's no place for lawyers. Don't get me wrong. I need them too. I'm not suggesting there's no place for doctors. If I got a headache, I'll take medication. Um, but I, my lifestyle of faith, I believe God will work with that medication. I also believe God will work with the lawyer. But the lawyer is not the source. God will work with the surgeon. God will work with the doctor. But that doctor, I pray, will be an instrument in the hand of God. And I still live by faith. Whether you do your business, whether you're going to a doctor, whether you're going to a lawyer, whether you're going to a bank manager, you still do that by faith. So faith must be a lifestyle. You're not looking for the systems of this world to be your source. You're not looking for human intelligence to be your source. God is your only source. And faith links you to God in the name of Jesus. But we do live in a body. When we get saved, when you're born again, every one of you receives the measure of faith. So if you're born again, you have been given by God the measure of faith. Now, Romans 12, 3 declares, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you. So you see, he's talking to every man. But he's talking to the church. He's not talking to unsaved people. Unsaved people have not been given this measure of faith. Paul prayed that we, he be delivered from wicked men. Because not all men have faith. So until Jesus comes into your heart, you don't have this faith. So when Jesus comes into your heart, God gives you faith in seed form. Everything that God gives you is always in seed form. God never gives you the full-blown harvest and that's the end of everything. Never. In 46 years, whatever God has given me has got to do with seed to sow and bread to eat. In that. I mustn't eat the seed and I mustn't give away the bread. 
because God's provision is both seed and bread. But he gives seed to sow and he gives bread to eat. Now, everyone among you to not think of himself more highly than he ought to think. We're going to deal with some of these things about boasting, about being prideful when you accomplish something because you forget it's through God's faith that you accomplished it. You forget that God was your total source. And it's so easy sometimes that you start feeling so good about yourself and that you start thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think. You start thinking you better than somebody else and it starts to be dangerous because the Bible says be careful you that think you stand lest you fall and so the more God blesses you the more humble you should be the more you should serve God the more you should honor God but so God is bringing that balance. He's speaking to everyone amongst us not to think of himself more highly than, to ought, than you ought to think, but to think soberly. Wow. Don't think like you get drunk with self. Get drunk with pride. So I'm not talking about alcohol. It's talking about sober thinking. What's a sober thinking? According as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So you understand when you got saved, God gave you faith in seed form to sow it, to grow it, so you can grow in Christ, become more mature, become more faithful, more honorable, more loyal. You can become more wealthier, more healthier. Now as you begin to climb this ladder of more and more than enough, you got to guard against selfishness. You got to guard against self. You got to guard against pride. Because that is what caused, caused Lucifer to fall. He was a created angel. And he was an angel that covereth the throne of God in the presence of God. And then he got proud. He wanted to be above God. He wanted to be above people and yet he was a created spirit. And pride was found in him. And you see, pride goes before the fall. And that's why the more humble you are, the more powerful you are. The more loving you are, the more powerful your faith is. So love and humility must work powerfully in our lives. And we'll be able to sustain this life of faith. And so everything that God gives you is a seed for what God has for you in harvest. You see, God gives you harvest promises, like Ephesians 3.20. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think, according to his power that worketh within you. So his name is El Shaddai. He's more than enough. He is a God of super abundance. But it doesn't happen overnight. You will sow the seeds of the word of God into your heart. You will win souls. You'll sow your money. Whatever God gives you, part of what God gives you is seed to sow. For what? For your harvest. Because God promised you harvest. But there can never be harvest is no seed you sow in. The greatest seed is the word of God. So don't be afraid of superabundance. Don't try to apologize about not having superabundance. 
We all started somewhere until we got to where we are. And so we had to sow and sow and sow and sowing the word of God in our hearts and winning souls and sowing it into other people has been our lifestyles. Now, I want to read this in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ, of Jesus our Lord. How many want more grace? Can I see your hand? How many of you want more shalom? Can I see your hand? We all want it. In fact, peace does mean prosperity. Now, this multiplication of favor and prosperity and wholeness comes through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. It's not just the knowledge given to you. Can you see that? It's grace and peace multiplied through the knowledge. He gives seed to the sower, bread to the eater. Then he multiplies the seed sown. The word of God is a great to seed. You don't even have to start with money. But the word of God will will give you employment. The word of God will give you health. The The word of God will bring you finances and put it on your table. And grace, favor will be multiplied. Peace, prosperity, wholeness covers a lot of areas of wholeness. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Is multiplied. It's through the knowledge of what? Then there's this word according. And an interesting study is to write down in the New Testament how many times when you're reading the Bible you find that word according. It's from a word kata. It means this will happen according to this. It's not that God's holding something back. It's that he gives you everything in seed form. And the harvest is in the seed. But the seed must be planted. Don't eat that seed. Don't let your heart be wayside ground. Don't let it be stony ground. Don't let it be thorny ground. According as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Wow. Sometimes we are praying for what God has already given us. Can you see that he's given us how many things that pertain to life and godliness? What does that mean? He, he, has, he has, first of all, already given you. Is he still going to give you? Does that scripture say, according to his divine power, that still will give you all things? He has given us all things. So if he's given you all things, why are you praying for all things? The only reason you don't have the all things, you haven't sowed the seed of the word of God. He's given us all things according to the knowledge of God, according to the seed of God, according to the word of God. It pertains to life and godliness. What does that mean? God has given you everything you will ever need to live this godly life. He's already done it. And how has he done it? It's all in this book. It's all in the Bible. But this Bible is a barn of seed according to him that called us unto glory and virtue. It's through the knowledge of him that called you to the superabundant living and this virtue, excellent living. You can never live excellently if you don't plan to be excellent. So you must plan to be excellent in every area of your life, not only business. Excellent in your, as a wife to your husband. Excellent in, as a husband to your spouse, your wife. Excellent as a parent to the children. 
excellent in our relationships. So he calls us to this glorious life and to this virtue, and that word virtue is excellence. Our biggest problem is we're not getting the word to live in our hearts so that it's sown there to bring forth the harvest. He's given you all things through the knowledge of him. Through the knowledge of him, through the knowledge of him, him called you to glory and excellence. Him called you to glory and excellence through this knowledge. This knowledge reveals to you that God has given you everything you will ever need. So you don't think you don't have it. (laughs) So you don't think I don't have my healing. You don't think this way, I don't have the money. Because if you're thinking like that, you don't believe he's given it to you. But he's given it to you in seed form. And so you have to plant it in your heart. You have to plant it in your mind. And that word of God has got to take on life. Whereby given unto us. Again, given. Things are just given. Oh, God is so benevolent. Whereby are given unto us. Exceeding. Great. And precious promises. Wow. Promises in the Bible. That by these you might be partakers of his divine nature. Wow. So he shares the attributes of his nature with you. But remember, never forget what I'm saying this morning. He gives you that in seed form. So as a seed comes into harvest, you'll find God's nature becomes your character. God's virtues become your character. It's so beautiful to see it. And what happens, the more that happens in your life, the more you escape corruption that is in the world through lust. We live along the sea. And the way things get corroded, you can't believe it. you just got to oil it and... And, and make sure you buy things that don't get rusted easily. And so rust, some people got rust in their money, rust in their relationships, rust in so many areas. If you, you, you complain, you say, how can, how can I stop these things from happening? But God says, whereby are given unto you exceeding great and precious promises. This book must become your lifestyle. Must become your lifestyle. Come on. Give the Lord a big hand. Must become your lifestyle. This is a barn of seed. Whereby given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. And so the word of God must grow. So what is a lifestyle? Sometimes God just drops a thought like that in me and opens up. If faith is a lifestyle, the just shall live by faith. So what is a lifestyle? What is a lifestyle? You see, sometimes we say, faith is a lifestyle, and then it's gone over. People say, what's a lifestyle now? What's, what's that? But, so I want to break these things down for you. A lifestyle must be, number one, you please God. You must have that as a lifestyle. There is a fear of God in my heart. The fear of God is that God governs with fixed laws. God doesn't go to the sun and hold the sun and say, it's time for you to rise. It's time for you to set. God doesn't go to the seas and say, change your seasons now. No, he put laws, natural laws in the universe and those laws govern the outcome of people's of creation. He put spiritual laws into the universe and those laws govern the outcome of our lives. And one of those laws is sowing and reaping and one of those laws is the law of faith. You cannot sow to the flesh. 
and think, I'm going to reap a beautiful future. Now, there may be some people that you don't know the inside story. <laughs> you don't know people. Only God knows people. Be careful of fashioning your life after people that outwardly, seemingly look happy and prosperous. Prosperity covers many areas, not only money. And so some people don't, will be very wealthy. And then you want to run after that person. But is that person running after God? I don't want you to run after me if I'm not running after God. Don't ever do that. You follow me, like Paul said, as I follow Christ. It's very important who you follow. And so you must follow people who please God. Faith pleases God. You follow people who have the fear of God. Secondly, the lifestyle means that there's territory to protect. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle for me to protect my life. It's a lifestyle. There's self-preservation in all of us. It's a lifestyle for me to protect my family. So the lifestyle is, is protection. Protect your business, protect your territory, protect the studying, protect everything. Faith can protect you. We'll share the scriptures. Number three. But territory has to be extended. You must extend, enlarge the place of your tent. Make your living bigger for you to enjoy life better. You live in a broader place to have a better life. And then number four, life is designed to increase. You must increase your life by soul winning. You keep winning souls, you're planting Jesus. You are actually farming Jesus. You're called to be a farmer. So I want to close it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Uh -uh, it's worked for us. It's worked for Ma Ann and I. It's worked for people that are not ashamed. It's worked for people that made it a lifestyle. I've seen it not work for people who don't make it a lifestyle. Once you've been doing something for 46 or 47 years, you've been round the block a few times and you've learned some things. But wherever you are today in your life, today you can make a commitment to God. and Say, God, I am going to make living by faith a lifestyle that I can do it consciously so much that it can become something unconscious as well. You see, if you practice something so much, then it will eventually be a lifestyle. I shared with you breathing. You can do it consciously. In other words, you can... So we taught that it's good to do that. You do breathing exercises. You, you got to do that consciously. But we also know that programmed in the unconscious mind is your, the beating of your heart, is the breathing in and breathing out. It's something unconscious. Now, because God respects your choice, you're going to have to first make a conscious calculated decision, like exercise, like eating right, like refraining from different li lifestyles. Like when I got saved, the alcohol went away easy, but the smoking didn't. I had to just put, bite the bullet. Some things you do get delivered, some things 
you got to press into that deliverance. And so make this a lifestyle. How you make it a lifestyle? You consciously are aware that I must do this 24-7. Set a guard over my mouth. Let the meditations of my heart, the words of my mouth be acceptable unto you. Every time a negative word comes in, I must repent, change my mind, and, and, and turn and do the faith. I guarantee you, if you just do it like that over and over and over again, it'll seep from here into here that it will become an unconscious expression of living. The just shall live by faith. Then you please God 24-7. Then you protect what God has given you 24-7. Then you increase your territory 24-7. And then you win souls 24-7. Have you received something this morning? Give the Lord Jesus a big hand.